started our first afternoon session, so we have three speakers lined up. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't me, but before we get there, we're going to have Jonathan Corgan. Uh, not much more to say about him, because I introduced himself, co maintainer of uh, VU Radio. Uh, so, this the purpose of the talk, the next three talks, is they're directed in this tutorial concept, so these are really looking into the radio a little bit more uh, about some features and tools and techniques and things that go on um, underneath. So Doug's going to be looking to the radio itself as a scheduler. How's the audio level here? Bring it back every So, as Tom said, the, the purpose of these uh, afternoon sessions today uh, and tomorrow um, are really to take a little bit deeper dive into some parts of the radio that um, uh, you know, yesterday was the intro session, so we can focus on things that we'll need to learn right away. Um, these afternoon sessions are, are more of a deep dive into some of the more technical aspects of the radio and, and how things work. This uh, presentation here is it's fairly brief, uh, and a half hour. Uh, I'll get back on schedule and we'll start a little bit late. But what I wanted to um, focus on here was some, something that's been considered somewhat of a mystery in the radio. It's been around the new radio scheduler, um, we call it the runtime, uh, and some of the earliest code that was written in the new radio. And when we, when we talk about how the new radio is a framework for running SDR applications, that framework is this thing we call the runtime that uh, is the thing that sort of coordinates all of the work on the machine. And so we, uh, came up, I, I say we, I wasn't around at the beginning. But we had this idea that unlike simulation environments, we really wanted to uh, build a system that was uh, focused on real time hey, streaming performance. Hey. Are you? And in most radio systems, uh, you know, particularly at the file layer, uh, you're, you're, you're not dealing with packets yet, you're not dealing with information that has boundaries. Uh, you're dealing with, you know, Shovel loads of uh, A to B samples or our transmitters, samples that you need to generate and send out to adapt. And so the design of the new radio scheduler and the design of how uh, the new radio uh, runs the application that you create uh, is very much focused on as high throughput as possible, even to the point where some things are harder to do because of the way we had to do things uh, underneath uh, the API uh, to make it run fast. And in particular, uh, in most traditional array processing environments, uh, what you have is an array of samples that you're, you want to process. You, you either retrieve them from the hardware, or there are things that you're going to turn into something that you send to the hardware. Uh, and you pass the array of data to a function. Uh, that function returns a value. You might assign that to another variable. Then you pass that to another function. Uh, and so on through whatever sequence of DSP operations that you need to do uh, to accomplish a certain processing chain. Uh, and even in, in environments where um, things are visually arranged in something that, uh, that might appear like this, the underneath the cover, so to speak, is, is often quite serialized. And we wanted to, and again I say we, but early in radio folks, wanted to do it in a way that would scale with you know, increasing computational power easily. Uh, and so the, the original scheduler, uh, or the original environment for the radio, meant that you would instead break your uh, DSP operations in a separate computational unit that will run parallel. And initially, it was virtually parallel. We were on one core of the machine. We had this thing called the single credit scheduler uh, that was then broken up into we're all talking about today, which is what we call the thread for block schedule. And the mental gymnastics that you have to go through uh, to think of how to make an application in this environment are sometimes challenging. I work with literally hundreds of new radio users a year, and oftentimes the switch from a traditional computation environment to this kind of parallel data flow machine is not so easy to make. That's, that's why we have this tutorial. So there's a lot going on in this. Um, this is a picture of underneath the API. Now, when you're writing a new radio application from inside DRC, or if you're writing it from uh, uh, directly in Python, 
your thinking in terms of what you want to do and how you get these things together. You don't have to really know how any of this works, except for sort of the abstraction leaks, except for when this does something to your throughput or your latency or it has unexpected um, implications on the algorithm that you write here. And so uh, I'll attempt to sort of explain the sequence of operations happening underneath the covers when you develop uh, either writing your own video radio block or when you're connecting these uh, in a stream with pre-written blocks that come from the radio. Um, the first thing that we have to understand is that these computational units that are running have a completely independent scheduler. So the thing that, um, I have to remember the black on red that looked very well on these. But the thing that uh, is sort of in control is this runtime scheduler that exists entirely independently for every single processing block that you have. Um, it's very different from a traditional environment where you've got this one thing that's your application that's scheduling everything that's happening. Instead, with a thread per block scheduler, um, you have two parts to your block. You've got this work function that's doing the streaming DSP, and a more recent addition is our message handling system. And the runtime is responsible for being asleep normally and then being woken up by some event. Typically, it's either the arrival of the message or it's some notification from a block upstream or downstream that something has changed. When the scheduler wakes up, it then has to evaluate whether or not it needs to do anything. So uh, an upstream block might have signal, I've written some data to my output, or a downstream block might have said, hey, I freed up space because I consumed some of the, the, the items out of your buffer. But new radio actually goes through quite a bit of work to avoid calling this function until it has blocks to do. Uh, the overhead of an iteration through the scheduler and the function call overhead and all of that is minimized by calling work as much to do as possible. So when you write your own new radio application uh, in the writing sort of what we call underneath the API, uh, so when you're writing your own blocks, you're creating this function that's responsible for reading data, doing something with it, and writing data. The, uh, the code that you have to write doesn't have to know anything about where anything is connected, the, the threading here, the memory allocation, or any of that. The, the code that you write gets called by the scheduler with pointers and some numerical values that say how much space you have and how much processing you have. Uh, and you sort of like just leave it up to be reader to do everything. But behind the scenes, there's this really uh, sort of interesting dance between these blocks that are operating independently. So that um, this work call is actually delayed until all the conditions are met uh, for it to run. Some of those conditions might be, you've told me your radio in your block, um, I operate on at least a thousand items at a time, so don't call me until there's that many ready. Or um, I generate 10 output items for every one that I consume, so don't call me until there's enough room here for all the data that's over here. And so there's all these things that the scheduler will um, test before it decides to call your function. Um, also, the message handling system that it came later after it was designed is always checked for pending messages first before that work function is called. And so you have this dance of these blocks that uh, the scheduler will call any message handlers, and it will call this work function, and it will say, um, according to the conditions that you set, or the default conditions if you don't set any, um, here's a pointer to some input data, here's a pointer to some room to produce some output. Go do that, and then tell me what you did. And so at the end of your work function, you return a value, or there's another method that you can call produce, that says, well, you told me I could do this, this is what I actually did. And based on those return values or that produced value, the block will send an, a message downstream or upstream and say, I just produced some more data for you. Wake up and evaluate them. Or I just consumed some data out of this buffer. You might have more room. Go check things out. Uh, but of course, there could be multiple readers from this uh, buffer. And even though I've consumed these, other guys might not have. And so the upstream runtime doesn't uh, call the work on. 
So this happens in an iterative fashion um, in such a way that we shovel as much data as possible through this flow graph. Uh, and I can come back with this afterwards if there's any questions. But what that results in is a communication path between blocks where uh, if these are particularly on separate physical hardware cores and not just virtual threads that are being time sliced by the operating system, it means that this block can be writing into one portion of the buffer while the other block is reading from it. Uh, and you get the benefit of having that parallelism because your code can now spread over these multiple cores. And again, in the beginning, it, this is only done virtually on a single core with a single thread. Uh, and then when the Eric Blossom wrote the thread block scheduler, 2005, 2006 time frame. Uh, we went to this design, and the you know it has an impact on how you allocate this buffer. Uh, it has an impact on what you can do at the same time. You know, it used to be that uh, since all these ran in one thread, there'd be no deadlock or, or race conditions. Now you have to think about blocks truly having to have no side effects because if they do and they depend on each other, then you can run into these. Parallel programming issues uh, that are often subtle and hard to understand. But it's still the case now that if you are in this realm where you're just connecting blocks and building this flow graph and trying to run, you don't have to know about any of that. And if you're here writing this, you don't have to know anything about the connections between the blocks to threads or memory allocation. The only time this really comes into play is again when the abstraction leaks when this has an impact on the overall performance that uh, you, you don't understand why is this thing really slow, why am I getting this constant stream of uh, pose on my display and overruns, uh, you know, what's the real impact in our... Um, <laughs> our software tries to hide as much as this is possible for me. What this looks like, when you build these into these chains of simple processing elements, is that you have this pipeline of data that you want to run as quickly as possible. And this is sort of ignoring the control flow and the control plane that's sitting on top of, of this coordinating uh, state changes. Um, but you have these blocks that are separated by these buffers. And the, the, there are no input buffers, by the way, in your radio. They're all um, read pointers to an output buffer of an upstream block. So we have input ports and output ports, but only output buffers. If you, if you hear some explanation talking about input buffers, it's typically a, a misunderstanding of how this works. So the fundamental concept to keep in mind when we have to deal with performance and latency is that there's always a rate setting block. Something is um, the, the limit on the processing that's happening the new radio itself actually doesn't know anything about sample rates, doesn't know anything about walk clock time. All it is doing is as data is made available from some source that is producing it, um, it is shoveling it through as quickly as possible. And we have a, a, the, the flow control between the blocks is simply managed by when this buffer gets full and when it gets empty. So as soon as this work function has produced data, it will send a, a notification to the other thread which will wake up, check for messages, and then call work and say, um, you have more items for you to work on. So in the case where uh, you have a hardware source with a receiver, your buffers are going to stay mostly empty. Because what will happen in a, in a properly provisioned uh, application is you'll have no CPU power assigned. And so as data dribbles out of the hardware source, um, each of the blocks wakes up, processes it, writes it to its output, signify, or signals the downstream block, and it just percolates through the flow graph. And so the buffers stay mostly empty. And as the computational load goes up, they start to fill up. But sort of a steady state operation here is that the buffers uh, stay mostly empty. Now on the transmit side of the flow graph, where the hardware sync is at the end, the rate limiting block becomes this one, because it's consuming data at some fixed rate. And if you have a properly provisioned flow graph then with enough CPU power, the data will um, 
fill up the buffers. In fact, some of the upstream buffers will probably become full. And then now the hardware uh, rate limiting device is consuming some amount, which opens up space. So the upstream block now has room to consume some of its input and write to the output. And it's kind of like whole flow in semiconductors. This, this open top percolates back through the flow rack and the source generates more data to, to fill its output buffer. So in a normally operating video radio application, uh, I mean, this is all handled for you. You don't have to think about this. But you always want to have hardware as the rate limiting device in what your um, flow graph is doing. Now, if you do get to the case where you have sample rates that cause one of these blocks to begin to exceed the resources available to it, most typically it's computational resources where you're trying to do too much DSP on something. Then what will happen is uh, the upstream blocks the buffers will fill, the downstream blocks the buffers will run you. Now, if you're on a receiver uh, where this is the rate setting block right at the top, of course, now your hardware has samples that's received from the radio, but nowhere to put them. And if you're using the USRPs, you get that famous uh, O uh, for overrun. And there are various ways that you can um, uh, think about how to reduce the CPU power of, uh, of that block. Um, you can think algorithmically, like maybe I should be doing a, a FFT-based filter instead of a uh, convolution filter. Uh, or maybe um, I implement a multi-rate where I decimate more than once uh, to reduce some of the computational load instead of trying to do decimation all in one block. If I have a receiver or a transmitter application where it's the sink that is consuming data out of the flow graph at a fixed rate, this situation results in the sink needing to transmit and having nothing to do with uh, no, no samples to do with. And so you get the famous underwrite situations. Now another even more subtle problem is that if you have both a source and a sink that are tied to two clock domains, now you have a case where clock drift between the two of those clocks aren't coherent. Um, can cause this condition to happen, not because of too much computational load, but because one side is running slightly faster than the others. And so a classic case of that is, you know, you're receiving a signal and you're outputting the sound card, and the crystal in your SDR and the crystal in your um, sound card are wildly incoherent. And so you'll either fill up and overrun the sound card, or you will um, uh, drain all these buffers um, and the uh, sound card won't have uh, any samples to do anything. So we have some tools in Doom Radio that allow you to sort of look at this. Um, the, uh, well, actually, let's skip this. The other thing besides performance that comes into play is the latency in the flow graph. This is very good for performance. But if my data rate is 9,600 samples a second, and I've got very large buffers here, I'm going to end, end up buffering hundreds or milliseconds or even seconds at low data rate of data inside the flow graph. And so while the streaming performance is great, uh, the latency and the enemy goes really bad. Uh, and that's where we have um, some considerations about these buffer sizes and how they get allocated. Purdue Radio will, again, go to great lengths to take into account all the stuff that's connected. But the main thing it has to worry about is that there's this concept called an item size. If you have, for example, a complex IP stream, we'll have four bytes of single precision flow at I and four bytes of single precision flow Q, resulting in a complex sample occupying eight bytes of memory. Where your item size is eight, that's great. Um, in memory, you have physical pages that you have to allocate, typically 4K, and so your item size is a you know an even divisor of your page size. And you can allocate exactly you know, one or more pages uh, to contain those. But if for some reason your, op your item size is not an even divisor of two, uh, or of, of your page size rather, now you have this case where you have to allocate these very large buffers uh, so that eventually the two line up. You know, after one page, you know, they're, they're, it's still dividing a, an item, and eventually after a thousand pages, they finally line up. It's the, least common multiple of the uh, page size and your item size. So sometimes if you run a, a radio application and you have an item size that's like 1,017, uh, 
you know, some some buffer size that's a really odd number. You'll get a warning that you know you asked for a buffer size of this, and I gave you one that's like a hundred times bigger. Um, hopefully that's okay. Uh, and so some people have asked about that warning. That's where that comes from. Uh, another thing to consider then is with the thread per block scheduler, you want to have really twice the buffer size that you would, would expect, so that one block can be writing an entire um, set of data while the uh, receiving block can be reading out of a different part of the buffer. And that gives you um, a buffer size twice the size that you would normally expect. There's also a hint or, or a request that a block can make to the radio runtime to say, uh, only call me with multiples of this size um, space available, because I process everything in, in chunks of 4,000, or I process everything in chunks of 17. When that happens, of course, your buffer now needs to um, be able to accommodate that. If you say, don't call me until you've got 20,000 set, or call me in, in multiple of 20,000 byte increments, now these buffers might need to be larger. So in the end, what happens is when you radio allocates a, uh, a buffer of 32K, then it goes through this whole uh, gauntlet of code, and you can find this uh, in the uh, runtime directory, GR, PD Radio Runtime in the source code. Uh, this is in the flat flow graph, uh, .cc file. But it goes through this whole uh, bit of logic and then it outputs, um, here's the buffer size that we're going to use uh, for the connection between these blocks. And that takes into account all of these different things. That also means that you have to think about this if your latency you know, starts to get out of hand, uh, end to end on your flow graph. We do provide the ability to manually override this. The only thing that you can't override is that alignment between the item size and the page size. Uh, but you can actually set this inside in your radio companion on a block by block basis, or you can um, actually set it for all blocks. Uh, I'm not sure is that both or just one of them. The setting them for all blocks. And I think it's just the max. Um, but this is one of those things that if you do this and run into problems, chances are it's because you did this. Um, you're sort of overriding all this logic in the, in the running line. But you can shrink the buffers and make them smaller. Um, you can make them larger if you want to accommodate. The only real case I've seen is we have this thing called tag stream blocks um, that require the entire um, packet, tag stream packet, to live inside the buffer, so you might need to increase that. Uh, but by making this smaller, you decrease your latency. Uh, and you can make it so small that uh, effectively you have one core that's just switching between different algorithms, like in the single threaded case, because there's no memory to buffer to allow them to run in parallel. Now we do have some tools uh, that will let you... Um... Oh, there's just one kind of this one but that will let you monitor uh, sort of where you're at with this performance issue. One of them is just provided by the operating system. It's a process in, in core aware, excuse me, a thread in core aware process monitor called HTOP. Um, it comes with by default on the bunch of, it's probably by default on all the systems. But what it can let you do, we take the block names and make those the thread names in the OS, that when you use an OS uh, visualization for your um, threads, you can see the actual blocks. And what I'm running here is a um, GFSK uh, loopback simulator that we have as one of the examples in our digital modulation section of your radio. And it's a little hard to read, but I can see 68.5, um, which means that this application is running um, about two-thirds of one quarter. And if I look at, that's the whole application, and if I look at the individual threads, I can see that 10% of that uh, is in the binary slicer of the receiver, which is quite high. Uh, there's another 9% that's in the quadrant demodulator, another 9% in the frequency modulator on the transmit side. So you can get a very quick read uh, on what uh, your application is doing from a performance point of view by using HTOP. And I can do this live, but uh, we're a little bit behind. Uh, but that will let you know if one of these is hitting 100%. That's a very quick thing you can run. Uh, 
There's another tool available on Linux, uh, the Linux Earth tools. Um, you have to install these, uh, and they change every time the kernel changes. So every time you upgrade the kernel, it, you got it. It doesn't always automatically pull this along. But now this will give you a um, profile of the functions that your application is in at each clock tick. And so it's a, it's a standard sampling profile. But I can see here, even though the red doesn't show up very well, that the fast ATAN function that is used in the GFSKD modulator, um, that says 12 point something percent. So I can see that 12% of the CPU of this 68% is in that one function. I can see that another 12% is in the analog frequency modulator on the transmit side, which we saw again in the HTOP. I can see that the uh, dot product Volk um, SSE function is taking up another 12%. So about 36% or about half of this application is the CPU in those three blocks. And that is um, an indicator that you know, as I increase sample rates and I and make it work harder, those are the ones that are going to peg first. And so I might think, well, can I break that into multiple blocks, especially if the blocks that I've written, or maybe I rethink my algorithm again, maybe doing multi-rate estimation instead of things all at once, uh, or implementing a different kind of filtering. Uh, another common one is you know implementing filters with transition bands that are create thousands of taps long filters. Uh, you don't really need that precision of the uh, filter, uh, so you can lower that. So there's a lot of things that, that come up over and over again um, here. Uh, uh, View Radio also has something called the performance monitor or performance counters. Um, the counters are things that get turned on just before it calls work, and they get stopped right after work returns. And there's a variety of them, but the ones that you can easily monitor are how many clock cycles are spent in the work function. Um, it can record at the time of the uh, call to work how full the buffers were. And it can uh, also uh, measure the throughput of data through a block. And so these performance counters are exported over a feature of the new radio called Control Port. And Control Port is a, it's a much larger feature set that allows you to do RPC over network to query values uh, in your blocks. Uh, but the performance counter system uses that so you can run a tool um, that can query all the blocks and get all the statistics um, that are being measured by the performance counters. So if you really need to get to that level of granularity in your performance uh, evaluation, um, this is the direction that you would go. And you can actually add your own um, variables that can be queried. So your performance monitoring can also include custom things that you measure in your block and export as, a, as an RPC queryable variable. Now, uh, Control Port was turned off for a couple of releases because we had some licensing issues with the underlying protocol that we were using to communicate between the client and the uh, application. Uh, but that's been resolved now. We're using something called Apache Thrift. Uh, you might, anyone familiar with that? Is that really well? uh, you will be if you use this. Uh, it's a little bit raw. Um, we have to use sort of a patched version uh, to get it working uh, just right. But um, it does work. Control port is turned back on. Um, I think we have an Android presentation uh, later in the week uh, where all the communication is, uh, or you can, you can look at this performance monitor uh, on your phone and have a point over the network to an application running on your PC. Um, and we ship a couple of uh, applications with GNU Radio that let you visualize these parameters. So over here on the left, this control port monitor program uh, will, you, you run this and you give it the network port that the uh, thrift is, is uh, listening on and it will contact that and query all these variables and you can look at for all of the blocks. I mean this is just one block and it's got 20 values. Um, so you can get all that data. And not only can you get that from this application, but you can get it programmatically if you write your own Python code that talks to Thrift and query your program. We also have a visualizer that shows, uh, uh, this is so it's sort of a very quick and dirty application, but what it lets you see is the size of the block is the amount of CPU and the darkness of the lines connected is how full the buffers are. And so here, this GFSK modem has a transmitter, a channel model, and a receiver. And 
you can see that on the transmitter, the buffers are mostly full, and on the receiver, the buffers are mostly empty, just like we talked about um, earlier in the presentation. Uh, the USB drives that you were issued um, when you checked in have all of this set up and running. Uh, we're a little bit late. I can show a demo of this if you want, or uh, we can wait. But, the, but if you boot from the USB drive, you can run a new radio app, like GRC, like we did with the FM radio uh, yesterday, and then just run one of these programs from the command line and see all of these this is like. So that's all set up and then working uh, on the USB drive. And uh, you know you can experiment with it quite easily. Yeah. So this is actually the live environment booted on my laptop here. And I can open up GRC. First time is always slow. And open. Old guy glasses in there. Uh, open the examples directory. Uh, open digital. Go to the DMOD and uh, GFSK loopback uh, example program. So this is a very simple flow graph to uh, create a um, sort of a data that's, that's a sine wave that gets turned into bits that get encoded in packets, goes through the modulator, goes through the demodulator, gets decoded, and uh, you'll see the original sine wave come out of the time sync. Um, and then you can see the uh, uh, output of the um, demodulator as well uh, in another time sync. So what this looks like very simply is um, here where we have the uh, waveform, this is what it looks like on the transmitter. It gets modulated with GFSK, and then we're actually looking at the output of the receiver here. Uh, but the point of all this is that I can do a, and see that on port 9090, um, Thrift is listening for a connection. And so I can either run the GR um, uh, control port monitor, And I can see all of the values here uh, for all the different blocks. Uh, it's kind of an eye chart. Um, but I can see in real time uh, these changing. Uh, so that we typically look at the instantaneous value, the average value, and the variance. So you can judge how things are changing over time. And this one the control point monitor can look at uh, Multiple flow graphs, um, you just have to specify your configuration of port to listen on uh, when you run the, the radio application. Um, the other thing that you can do is run the performance monitor, the graphical one. And this is the same thing that we saw on the slide. We're looking at it now, it's sort of instantaneous, and you can see that the CPU is all over the place. But if I change that to average, now we can see that, um, again, on the transmitter, the buffers are mostly full. Most of our CPU is taken up either in the modulator, um, the quantity demodulator, but or this FIR filter that's used as part of the interpolator on the transmitter. And that dot product volt function that we saw that was 12% is the volt function that's called by this interpolation filter. Question. What are the X and Y axes? Uh, they're not really. Uh, this is a, a rendering of the flow graph, sort of, uh, we use this thing called Python Network X. Uh, so this is just a, I mean, you can ignore the numbers, they probably should have been turned off. Uh, so we just see, we're, we're starting here, here's the transmitter, uh, and here's the, uh, the timing recovery and the slicer and, and, uh, and the output. Uh, so there really is no X and Y on this. Uh, but if this was your own flow graph, uh, you know, of course, you start to see in real time where your bottlenecks are, and you know, I can crank up the data rate on this and see that the frequency modulator is going to become uh, the thing that blocks the program. Time for questions? We're a little bit late with this.